Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our Head and Neck Anatomy series. This video is going to be all about the salivary glands. We're going to start with some basic salivary gland anatomy. This term acinus is pretty important, and that's referring to a sac-like cavity that's going to be actually producing our salivary secretions. The serous acinus is going to be producing a watery type secretion. The acinus, the serous acinus pictured here is only going to contain serous cells. Those are the ones in this pink purple color. They're generally spherical in shape and this is an example of an acinus that's going to be producing serous secretion. The mucus acinus is going to produce lipid heavy fatty type secretion. This one's going to contain only mucus cells pictured in white here and those cells are generally more tubular in shape, not as much spherical. But we also have a mixed acinus. This uh, contains a combination of both serous and mucus cells. And when you combine the two of them, the mucus cells kind of swell and push the serous cells into a cap at the end of the tube into this half moon shape. And so that's how it earned its name, serous demilune, meaning a half moon. So when you combine both of those into one tube structure, you're getting a mixed acinus that's producing both serous and mucus type secretion. The myoepithelial cells are these little thin cells at the edge of the tube, and they help squeeze out secretions. They're roughly equivalent to a smooth muscle cell. And then we also have ducts that are traveling through the salivary gland to eventually open up into the oral cavity. The intercalated ducts are, have a smaller lumen. The striated duct is a, an intersection of a bunch of intercalated ducts, and so it has a larger lumen. All right, so with that background, let's talk about the three main oral cavity glands. We'll start with the biggest one, which is the parotid gland. The parotid duct is called Stenson's duct. And that's definitely a good thing to know for the board exam. Stenson's duct pierces the buccinator and opens on the parotid papilla of the buccal mucosa. It's usually adjacent to the maxillary second molar. The parotid papilla is actually a little raised bit of tissue. Some patients might bite on it by accident. They might notice that it's irritated. And that is a normal piece of anatomy having that parotid papilla sticking out just a little bit and again usually at around the maxillary second molar. The parotid gland is going to be mostly producing serous secretion. It's powered by cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and those nerve fibers are going to originate from the inferior salvatory nucleus and travel mostly via the lesser petrosal nerve. We'll unpack, this, we'll unpack this pathway a little bit later in the video, but just for a general background, this is what is going to be telling the parotid gland to be producing this saliva secretion. As far as its location, the parotid gland wraps around the posterior border of the mandibular ramus. Here is an aerial view. We've made a cross section. We have the mastoid process the mandibular ramus, here is the medial pterygoid muscle and the masseter muscle. We also have the facial nerve running through here. And this is the parotid gland and you can see how the bulk of it is located lateral and superficial to the ramus and the masseter. Only a small portion wraps around the back. As far as vertical height, it extends from all the way down to the mandibular border all the way up to about the zygomatic arch. Again, it's the largest of these salivary glands, and there are a couple important pieces of anatomy that are located within the parotid gland. The five main branches of the facial nerve, so that, is, that are the, the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. Remember two Zanzibar by motor car. We also have the retromandibular vein, the termination of the external carotid artery, as well as the auriculotemporal nerve of V3. So a lot going on with the parotid gland. And next we have the submandibular gland. 
The submandibular duct is called Wharton's duct, another important name to know, and this one opens directly onto the floor of the mouth at the sublingual caruncles. Those are located on either side of the lingual frenum in the anterior floor of the mouth. The submandibular duct actually travels along the floor of the mouth for a while and crosses superior to the lingual nerve of V3. And so if you ever get an anatomical based question, that could be something that they ask. That duct is going to again empty onto the sublingual caruncle. This gland is going to be making mixed serous and mucus secretion, and it's powered by cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. Those nerve fibers are going to originate from the superior salivatory nucleus, not the inferior salivatory nucleus, and the corda tympani is going to be responsible for taking a lot of those fibers to that gland. The submandibular gland produces the majority of the saliva, although it's not the largest gland in size, it's going to be doing most of the work. It's also the most common site to have a sialolith, which is a calcification within a salivary gland. As far as its location, this one's going to wrap around the posterior border of the mylohyoid muscle. The bulk of this gland is below that muscle, and only a small portion wraps around the back and sticks out above the mylohyoid muscle. So technically, it's occupying both the sublingual space, which is up here, and the submandibular space, which is down below the mylohyoid. And lastly, we have the smallest of these three, the sublingual gland. The sublingual duct is technically a collection of a bunch of small ducts called the ducts of Rivenus, R-I-V-I-N-U-S, of which Bartholin's duct is the largest. This one's going to open directly onto the floor of the mouth and at the sublingual caruncles. It's going to be producing mostly mucus secretion, and just like the submandibular gland, it's powered by cranial nerve 7 and the similar nerve pathway. This one is located purely above the mylohyoid muscle at the anterior floor of the mouth. So I really like this table that I put together for understanding all of the different high yield facts that have to do with the autonomic nervous system pathways for salivary gland secretion. And I also threw in things like pupil constriction just for fun and for comprehensiveness. So let's start with the parotid gland. We know that the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to be what's powering that gland to activate. They're going to be parasympathetic nervous system fibers. They're going to originate from the inferior salivatory nucleus. The nerve that travels those fibers and carries them most of the way is the lesser petrosal nerve. Those preganglionic fibers are going to synapse at the otic ganglion and the postganglionic fibers are going to hitchhike on the auriculotemporal nerve of V3 to finally reach the parotid gland. If we went to the submandibular and sublingual glands, like I just said, they have the same exact nerve pathway. Cranial nerve 7 is going to be what's working there. Again, parasympathetic nervous system fibers are responsible for uh, controlling the secretion of saliva. They're going to originate from the superior salivatory nucleus carried by corda tympani of the facial nerve. They're going to synapse at the submandibular ganglion and then hitchhike along the lingual nerve of V3. You could do the same thing for the minor glands, and I grouped all these together, lacrimal, nasal, palatine, and pharyngeal. These are also being powered by the facial nerve, parasympathetic, originate from the superior salivatory nucleus, just like we did here. This time the greater petrosal nerve is going to be carrying those fibers. They are going to synapse in the pterygopalatine ganglion and then hitchhike on some nerves of V1 and V2. Uh, for the mucus glands, this is actually not a parasympathetic nervous system function. This is a sympathetic nervous system function, and they originate on this plexus located on the internal carotid artery. And the nerve here is the deep petrosal nerve, ganglion, pterygopalatine, and then similar hitchhiking as done here. 
So you can refer back to this. We also talked about pupil constriction uh, in our video on the extraocular and intraocular eye muscles. So that's a nice review for that as well. So really great table. I definitely strongly encourage you to be familiar with that. And here's an awesome picture putting all of it together. So you can reference the chart on the last slide together with this drawing to really help you visualize everything at work. For example, you could start up here at the superior salivatory nucleus. You could travel down the corda tympani nerve. You would synapse at the submandibular ganglion and then you could travel to the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland. Also note that the corda tympani is feeding the taste fibers to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. We could do this again. We would start at the superior salivatory nucleus, but this time we could go to the right and travel along the greater petrosal nerve, synapse at the pterygopalatine ganglion, and then hitchhike on the zygomatic and lacrimal branches to get up here to the lacrimal gland. Then you could also travel along other nerves to get to the nasal glands, the palatine glands and the pharyngeal glands not pictured here. And then you could start at the internal carotid plexus. You could follow the deep petrosal nerve, which is not affiliated with a cranial nerve. You would go through the pterygoid canal along with that greater petrosal nerve and also synapse at the pterygopalatine ganglion. And then you could hitchhike on the same zygomatic and lacrimal branches to get to mucous glands around the eye, around the nose, and all other parts of the face. So that's just an example of how you could track some of these nerve pathways and apply them to this table from the last slide. So hopefully that helps you visualize it and make sense of some of these more abstract concepts. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting me and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for all their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.